The Primist presents How Africa is Turning Its Desert into an Oasis Green Wall. The African continent will host the most significant demographic event of the 21st century. Africa's population already accounts for around 17% of the global population, the second highest of any continent behind Asia, accounting for almost 60% of mankind. However, Africa's population is rising at a far higher rate than the rest of the world. Africa is expected to house around 40% of the world's population by this century. In contrast, Asia will have just 43% of the population. The emergence of Africa will primarily define the 21st century. In its ascension to global significance, the continent confronts several significant obstacles. Desertification is one of the most serious of these issues. The Sahel is a transitional zone between the harsh Sahara Desert and the comparatively less lush Sudanese savanna. Not as severe as the sand dunes above it, the Sahel is a tropical semi-arid region that gets seasonal rain ranging from 100 millimeters or 3.9 inches in certain sections of Sudan to 1200 millimeters or 47.2 inches in Mali. To make matters worse, rainfall in the Sahel is rare if not non-existent. Water will only come during the short rainy season, with nothing for the remaining eight months. Approximately 135 million people live in this region, which is still home to mortality. That figure is expected to treble by 2050 because of growing environmental difficulties caused by climate change. The Sahara Desert is the world's biggest and has increased by 10% since 1920. That alone covers around 554,000 square kilometers. In under a hundred years, a fertile region comparable to the combined size of Germany, the United Kingdom, Norway, Ireland, Cuba, and Denmark will be depleted. It is mostly the result of natural climatic changes and global warming. Many complicated climatic cycles influence Sahara conditions, such as the Atlantic Multidecadal Oscillation in the natural climate cycle, which shifts the Atlantic Ocean from warm to cold phases every 60 to 80 years. 11 nations and the African Union have joined forces to prevent desertification and reintroduce natural plant life to the area. It's known as Africa's Great Green Wall. This massive green wall, a 15 kilometer long investment, begins in Senegal and runs 8,000 kilometers east to Djibouti. They're planting drought-resistant acacia trees, which will keep water in the soil following rains. To date, around 11 million trees have been planted in Senegal. As a consequence, even deeper water wells in Senegal have been refilled. Over a decade, just 15% of the project has been completed, yet it has produced astonishing benefits. In Ethiopia, for example, 15 million hectares of degraded land have been rehabilitated, and around 15 million trees have been planted. To put that into perspective, 15 million hectares is the combined size of Belgium, the Netherlands, Switzerland, and Denmark. As a result, Ethiopia had a big success. Five million hectares of land in Niger have been rehabilitated, yielding 500,000 tons of grain each year. That is sufficient to feed 2.5 million people. Other nations had made advances with millions of tons of carbon absorbed from the atmosphere and returned to the land. The most astonishing aspect of this project is that it is quite inexpensive, costing just $8 billion. Just $1.4 billion have been invested is very inexpensive, given the extent and effect of those projects on local and global economy. The United States military budget for 2020 was $715 billion, to put this in context. Imagine if just 10% of this amount was spent rehabilitating the ecosystem. Unfortunately, it's only a dog howling at the moon. In this context, grazing by emulating the natural approach pioneered by Alan Savory is envisaged. Livestock is the primary source of desertification across the globe. As counterintuitive as it may appear, livestock is employed in this strategy to halt desertification and begin afforestation. So, this strategy works by transferring animals to a degraded grassland and not allowing them to graze for an extended period. Because of predators and frequent dangers, large herds of animals will not stay in the same spot for long in the wild. As a result, this strategy closely resembles nature. So what will remain in the area are plants and grass that have grown back in, shielding the soil from the light and preventing carbon and nutrients from entering the earth. Furthermore, 
Dung and cattle pee will act as natural fertilizers. When the soil is protected, its biomass becomes stronger and absorbs more carbon from the atmosphere. After a while, the environment will diversify with the addition of new plants and trees. China aims to assist eight Central Asian and African countries in their efforts to prevent desertification. Discussions are ongoing, with China anticipating that the UNCCD Secretariat would request a $2 million Chinese contribution within the country's budget to strengthen South-South cooperation. China complies a list of technology and demands for Belt and Road countries in desertification prevention and treatment. China has made substantial progress in combating desertification by launching major ecological efforts such as the Three North Shelter Belt Project and turning marginal crops into forests. There are several advantages and disadvantages to this. The pest and disease problem may intensify when the environment gets wetter due to more plant and tree planting. One issue that might arise is the issue of locust plagues. That's right, the biblical overtones of the swarming parasites are most well known. But wait, locusts can't be so dangerous, can they? Well, a little swarm eats more food in a day than 2,500 people can. So yeah, they can be dreadful. Second, it would have a cascading effect on the environment. A desert transports nutrients across oceans in the form of windblown dust. As a consequence, it's best not to overgreen any desert. Sand from the Sahara Desert, for example, is carried into the air by wind power. It arrives in South America after traversing the Atlantic. On its journey, the dust absorbs moisture, and as it falls from the sky, it delivers rain. This mixture of dust and rain falls on the Amazon jungle, fertilizing it and providing water to the ecosystem. Similarly, suppose we achieve this to mimic nature's strategy in the world's dry lands. In such a situation, it is anticipated that the soil would absorb so much carbon that greenhouse gas levels will return to pre-industrial levels while concurrently feeding hundreds of millions, if not billions, of people in developing nations. If you like this video, do give a thumbs up to the video. And also, subscribe and hit the notification bell for more exciting videos like this. Till next time, peace!